Very good. So welcome to Position of Neutrality. Welcome to New Freedom. Is there anyone in the room that, tonight that hasn't been here before? Oh, good. A whole bunch of you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Let us warn you in advance what we do here is just a little different than other meetings of other fellowships you may have attended. What we do here, we've been doing for lots of years. We take a look at the suggested instruction for a step or so a week directly out of this book. And we use this book in 12-step recovery. Why? The process described by the authors of this book has been proven to work for addicts of the hopeless variety, addicts to alcohol and other substances. So what we do here is not so much tell you what the book says, because that's none of my business what it says to you, but what I attempt to do is show you how I find what it says to me and then share that with you and encourage you to have your experience. If that makes sense, because it's a book of experience. And um, tonight, unfortunately, we find ourselves once again in step one. So step one is one of those steps where there'll be some highs and some lows, some hilarity and some deep sorrow because of the nature of it. If you come out of a first step experience and you're really giddy, you may have missed something <laughs> because powerlessness and unmanageability is an experience, not a theory, right? So we're going to revisit powerlessness and then we're going to hit a little power and you know, get us prepped for the next phase of the encounter, right? So what, first thing I want to do is show you a little something about the history of AA without getting too crazy. A lot of people just call this book the big book, but if you go to the title page, you'll see what it really is. And this is operative when you're working with people to let them know why we've left it the way it is for all these years, because the book is called Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. That's a pretty profound title. They're going to later tell us about the demographics, but why we want to know that is because this is their testimony. This was a, an incurable malady that people just died of for years. These people introduced a process through which a solution presented itself through them, and, and they were recovered, and they tell the story of that in these pages. Make sense? So. If you'll go forward to the first edition, they illuminate that a little bit. It's on XIII, Roman numeral 13. And they tell us who we is. How many of you have been in an AA meeting before? Anybody? Have you ever seen the posters on the wall and the steps? They're all there. Ever had anyone point out to you and say, we're a we program? That's fine. We may well be. But if we get confused about who the we is here, then we may miss the power of their testimony and we may miss what we need to do in order to duplicate the experience they described. Does that make sense? Yep. So they're going to tell us who we is. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. Notice how they said to show other alcoholics, not to tell them. One of the things we've learned over the years is someone has to show us. This is something that people impart. It's a, a peer model thing, if you will. Okay? So someone showed me, I endeavor to show you. Does that make sense? Okay. So I want to run from there over to the forward to the second edition. And I want to go to XVII, the bottom of the page, Roman numeral 17. And I want to explain something to you why we like to focus people on this book. We are not book worshipers, but I do believe in the power of testimony. And I want people to know that this is their testimony, not my testimony, but I will, as this goes along, give you my testimony as it aligns with theirs. And when that happens, you're going to feel something because testimony comes with power. And when you do feel it, I'm going to know, and I'm going to call your attention to it, because we would cheat you to talk to you about the power we call God without giving you a demonstration of that power. Right? And if you're baffled and going, why would he start talking about that? I want you to understand that we're going to share some power in here tonight. And, and when, you, when you feel it, that one who has all power is in the room. 
Does it make sense? Okay. So this is what they say. It was now time. I'm at the bottom of X, uh, Roman numeral 17. It was now time the struggling groups thought to place their message and unique experience before the world. This determination bore fruit in the spring of 1939 by the publication of this volume. So they sat around in kitchens, they read the Bible, and they prayed and meditated for four years, and then this book was produced in 1939. They said the membership had then reached about 100 men and women. The fledgling society, which had been nameless, now began to be called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of its own book. So why do we like to focus people on the book? Because the fellowship was named after the book, not the other way around. So if you think you're in the program and you're not in the book, you've been deceived. You're in the fellowship, but the program's in the book and the fellowship was named after the book. Not trying to dice anyone up, but how many of you have had some struggles getting here and staying here? Bounced a time or two? So we like it straight, right? I don't have any drug users in here, do I? We don't, we don't believe in cutting our own dope, right? I mean, it's a bad plan. So, all right. So, that's just some, some foundational stuff. I want to now go to the doctor's opinion. And I want to go right to the, the cover page of the doctor's opinion and take a look at what the doctor said and what the alcoholics said that are this first 100 who tell this story. So I'm at the top of the page, we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in a medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. So are you as people that have struggled with addiction interested in a medical estimate? Yep. Especially at this time when there was no real, there was no diagnosis, right? This is prior to 1970 when there was actually a medical diagnosis. Okay, so convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. So Dr. William Silkworth, known doctor in the field of addiction, back at this time, wrote the letter because of some of the things he'd seen, uh, some of the miracles that he had witnessed. It says, to whom it may concern, I've specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. If you're at one of the few treatment centers in the entire world that treats alcoholism and the doctor writing a letter about you says you're hopeless, how does that make you feel? How many of you have had a diagnosis where they said, you're dying? A lot of us have, right? Okay. So in the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas about a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. So some of you that study that other book, you know, he made a way where there was no way. How many of you have been in a treatment environment? How many of you told those doctors that you had some ideas and you're just going to go share them with their other patients? I'd like to point out to you that they let him. I've been locked down many times, and they didn't let me talk to nobody. <laughs> Just saying. So, I'm going to go over from there to XXVII at the bottom of the page. And it says, of course an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. So what is the doctor telling us alcoholic types about our condition? It's a physical craving and things physical I didn't necessarily create. It may have been a pre-existing condition. How many of you thought less of yourself when you started getting really twisted off because you thought 
that you were just doing it the way you wanted to and you just couldn't pull out. A lot of us are real self-condemning about that, right? So if I'm an alcoholic, I have this abnormal reaction he's going to describe. There's no other way I can drink except the way I drink. Um, so this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. What do you think they're talking about? Detox. Wow. He might, any of you have to go to detox? <laughs> before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. Okay. So we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. What do they mean by that, all those fancy words? Yeah, an allergy is a, an abnormal reaction to something, and this is just a particular manifestation, the action that it has on somebody like me, perhaps you. Right? How many of you have heard the jokes in the fellowship about, yeah, I've got an allergy, I drink, and I break out in handcuffs? You ever hear that? <laughs> very clever, but very deceiving. Because we laugh it off, and they go on to tell us the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. How many of you are drinkers? How many of you found alcohol energized you? It's a sedative. <laughs> that would be considered an abnormal reaction to a sedative. How many of you are opiate addicts? Heroin, fentanyl? Do you find that when you, when you had some, you were very energetic? And when you were out, everyone thought you were back on. And when you were hooked up, everyone thought, man, he's doing so good. <laughs> that would be considered an abnormal reaction. Does it start to make sense now? Because if we don't teach that right, then people misidentify what we're talking about. And if we don't think we're sick, we won't seek a healer. Anyway, um, these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it. Is that true for you? Once having lost their self-confidence, is that true for you? Their reliance upon things human, so their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Is that true for any of you? Just got real complex, right? Okay. So they go on to tell us that frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. How many people begged you to stop? If you loved me, you'd stop. Why do you do this over and over? How many of you desperately wanted to stop? How many of you desperately loved them? How many of you couldn't stop? Hmm. So the frothy emotional appeal didn't grab you either, huh? The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. So that's just straight truth, right from the doctor's opinion. He was a medical man. He was not. This is synthetic stuff he did. He could not access this. He was only witness to it, if that makes sense to you. He had no way. He had, he had the guy's hope, as far as I know, Dude's going to have to hook up with this power I've seen these other cats hit. Okay. So we're going to jump from there to Bill's story. I was going to do this whole other thing, but I like Bill's story because we like stories in 12-step recovery. And a lot of times we read them and we miss. So let's, let's review from about page five of Bill's story. And he just comes on in full-blown addiction. He says, liquor ceased to be a luxury, it became a necessity. Any of you remember the crossing over in your experience when you were no longer doing what you wanted to and you knew you weren't doing what you wanted to? He describes it, he says, bathtub, gin, two bottles a day, often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars and I'd pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. This went on endlessly and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. Any of you relate to that? A tumbler full of gin followed by a half dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Now look at the, he's describing to us the state of mind, see if you can relate to him. Nevertheless, 
I still thought I could control the situation. I drank till I'm sick. Then I'm so sick in the morning I have to drink again so I can go get more. I got to go lie or put it on a tab, but I got to get it. But I got this shit. I'm good. It's going to be better come Tuesday. Right? Okay. So he goes on to say, and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Any of you take someone with you on the train wreck? And they were encouraged until they weren't? Okay. So then he says, gradually things got worse. I love the way Bill writes, because look at what gradually is versus what he thinks it is. Any of you have a misperception in your addiction of what other people were going through? Yeah, because he does a really good job. He says, gradually things got worse, and he says, the house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died, and my wife and father-in-law became ill. <laughs> Ain't it grand? <laughs> then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point in 1932, and I had somehow formed a group to buy. Any of you get a business opportunity in the middle of headlong in your addiction? What happened? So what Bill said, I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender, and that chance vanished. Any of you ever drink away or use away an opportunity? One or two? Okay. So he says, I woke up. This had to be stopped. How many of you had that? Not going to pick up no matter what. I saw that I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. Before then, I had written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. How many of you meant business? How many of you at some point thought perhaps you overreacted? Shortly afterward, I came home drunk. There had been no fight. Do you relate to him? Yeah. Like, I know this is it. I'm not doing it, again, expecting a different result, like I've heard people say. I'm doing it with no expectation of a different result. I'm starting to learn of powerlessness. Where had been my high resolve? So he's got a question mark. He wants you to go inward. How many of you had a high resolve to behave differently? Could manifest no outward action to do so. Yeah, so some of you are feeling like, whew, that's also the spirit. We're revisiting that time, so you know. But we're, we're talking to you with depth and weight. The spirit is taking you to a place so that you'll know what's up, who you are, whose you are. I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way, and I had taken it. Was I crazy? Another question mark. How many of you wondered about your sanity? Not like in the funny way, right? Like, I, I'm not thinking, I'm thinking good. Yeah? Okay. I began to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. So that's when Bill's starting to tell you what alcoholic insanity really is. It's an appalling lack of perspective. In spite of what keeps happening over and over again, I'm simply unable to act the way I want to. Yeah? So renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed, and confidence began to be replaced by cocksureness. So how many of you had a little clean time? And got to thinking, I got this. You even had friends saying, you got this, right? <laughs> you ever had that happen? When you're already starting in the spin, they go, you got this. I hope so. <laughs> Not looking good. Anyone know what I'm talking about? So I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone, and in no time I was beating on the bar asking myself how it happened. How many of you found yourself using or drinking again with no intention? Just it, the opportunity presented itself. And then what did you do? Might as well get high now, right? <laughs> Shit, we'll fix it tomorrow, right? As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I'd manage better next time, but I, I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. 
The reason I call your attention to his experience is later he's going to write a chapter to you. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. And an extraordinarily important part of the path is recognizing our own personal powerlessness. Right? Okay. So the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. He says they're unforgettable. How many of you drank again or used again after some time in clean time? So do us all a favor and take on that remorse, horror, and hopelessness. You can feel it to this day, can't you? That's what he told you. It was unforgettable. It marks us. Yeah? That's also that healing we receive when we pull someone else out. Because we know that signature, we're, we're empowered with the signature that heals. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so the courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollable and the, uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I ha- hardly dare cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me that the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. Ever get to the point where you just knew there was no point in trying again? Because if I try again, I'll just fail again, and I can't fail if I don't try. Because that's what he's starting to talk about. Most of us, if we took it far enough, we know that sense. Okay. Says that was a hard thought. It is, isn't it? Some of you are still stuck there. Okay. Should I kill myself? How many of you got to that point? Yeah, that's no joke either, is it? And it doesn't shut up just because it doesn't make any sense, because it makes a lot of sense in the moment that it makes sense, doesn't it? Then a mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that, so two bottles and oblivion. That was my rescuer. I needed a spirit to rescue me, always. At the point of death, I needed the spirit, right? So whatever is going to show up for me as a solution is going to have to be spiritual. Just that way, right? All right, so the mind and body are marvelous mechanisms for mine endured this agony two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. So how many of you went over and over just beating yourself because of your inability to conduct yourself in a way that was acceptable to you and your families? It's torturous, isn't it? There were flights to, from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. And then came the night when the physical and mental ter- torture was so hellish, I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor lest I suddenly leap. A doctor came with heavy sedative. Any of you take it to delirium tremens and, and get really sick and have to be evacuated? Not everyone does that. I did. I drank to delirium tremens and then I tried to cut my teeth out with a commando knife and they had to come strap me down and haul me out and uh, then they came with gin and sedative (laughs) I found a solution better living through chemistry so the next day found me drinking both gin and sedative any of you do that how many of you solved your alcohol problem with a little methamphetamine solution Okay, so, you know, don't get it twisted. They're all symptoms, but we, we did a little of that, right? Okay. So this combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. So did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. Where's my meth addicts, my cocaine? Yeah, 40 pounds underweight or so. All right. My brother-in-law is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much, 
Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I'd been seriously ill bodily and mentally. So Bill's recounting the story of his encounter with William Silkworth, who explained to him, dude, quit beating yourself. You can't drink any different than the way you drink because you're alcoholic. You didn't drink yourself to alcoholism. You are an alcoholic, therefore you drink that way. And it made all the difference for him to finally realize that he could indeed receive this redemption he sought. Okay? So, it relieved me somewhat to learn in alcoholics the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor. Though it often remains strong in other respects. How many of you learned that about yourself? You had trouble staying away? The just say no plan was complex for you? But there were other areas of your life where you could be quite forceful. Yeah? My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. See, if we don't help people understand that what's up with them is beyond them, but it's not because of them, they'll, they'll never receive what we have for them. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. They talk weird in this book. <laughs> what does it mean, the goose hung high? Things are good, right? Got three or four months, feeling a little better. Okay. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. How many of you had some self-knowledge? Drugs bad. <laughs> Got it. Did it work? No, we're going to have to read more. But it was not, for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. Notice how he said the declining moral and bodily health. Any of you find yourself doing things you said you would never do, look down on other people for doing? Yeah, we're not shaming anybody. I mean, that's what we know, right? I even know where the best dumpsters are where the likelihood of something nasty being poured on it isn't as high. You guys want a map? <laughs> <laughs> the curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. So how many of you bounced a while and then back in again and started to feel like a repeat this was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. Did any of you get to that place? Still had people trying to help you, but like everybody is hearing that, you know, he's really dying. And like, don't tell me what I already know. Tell me when. That's the little piece I don't know. And you know what I'm talking about? Okay. It was a devastating blow to my pride. Can you guys remember figuring out you were drinking or drugging yourself to death? Maybe you were getting incarcerated over and over again. Maybe you were doing whatever. And all you could think of is what will people think? Am I the only one? I'm like, I'm living in a freaking bush, dude. What do they think? Hand me a fucking sandwich. Um, but that's the way the mind works. That's the point. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of thoughts who'd gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. So now it's so bad I can't even do a right turn. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. So there's another one you want to take yourself to. He says no words can describe it. He tries 
but it really is hard to describe how deep in we get, isn't it? So you can, you can feel it when he describes it, if you dare. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Any of you ever been sobered by fear? Okay. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink, and on Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. One of the things we need people to understand is the insanity precedes the drink. I've heard for years in fellowship, people say, once you take a drink, then the insanity sets in. No. Then the allergy sets in. The insanity started before I took the drink, which means I have no mental defense. That's why my ideals must be grounded in a power greater than myself, because I have, at a certain time, the alcoholic cannot bring to consciousness with sufficient force the memory of suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. He is without defense against the first drink. It's their experience. It's mine, too. Right? So the people that are teaching, just play it through. Think, you know, think it through. Play the tapes. Not if you're a real deal. Ain't going to work. Okay. So he goes on to tell us about how dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. Where's my meth addicts? Y'all like catapulting. So he's about to describe a progressive recovery catapulted into a fourth dimension of existence. And he's going to tell you what that looks like, so we don't have to define it. He tells us exactly that he was to know, I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. So addiction was a lifestyle for me. Any of you feel me? So I need a new manner of living. I don't need a workbook exercise, and I don't need a club. I need a new manner of living. It needs to occupy my time, and it needs to occupy my heart, and it needs to occupy my mind. Otherwise, I don't stick. Yeah? Okay? So near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. Any of you ever sat drinking or using alone? With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. Wow, that's like a bonus, right? <laughs> My wife was at work, so he sat in the stage. He's alone, got plenty. She's away. We are going to twist off, right? <laughs> I wondered whether I dared hide a, a full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. Any of you take it that far? Drinkers or hiders? Yeah. My musing was interrupted by the telephone. A cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. They put that in italics, and you got to get who this guy is. He's just, this is Ebby, Bill's old drinking buddy. How many of you, no matter how bad you got, you always maintained one friend that was a little worse than you? So at least I'm not that bad yet. That's who Ebby is for Bill. So when Bill says he called and he's sober, that's not like, oh, he's sober. That's like, he's sober? Like it can't be happening, right? So it was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. He's trying to get you to see how profound this experience that's about to happen is to him. Rumor had it that he'd been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he had escaped. That's how impossible it is, right? Of course he would have dinner, and then I could drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. So what is an oasis typically? Our idea of an oasis as It might be a water source in the middle of a dry patch. 
but it's quite often a mirage, right? Well, I mean, he, he has such good imagery. Can any of you remember just being sicker than hell and then someone came you could drink openly with and you had stash? The door opened and he stood there fresh-skinned and glowing. Guys, these are two old drunks. War heroes, right? It's weird to describe your drinking buddy as fresh-skinned and glowing. <laughs> That's weird. I'm not trying to poke fun. That's weird, right? Something has to be different. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. He's wanting to focus on this. How many of you, when you're in your cups, in the worst of it, you ran into someone you had run with and they were well? Remember that, how strange that was to see and you knew it was somebody you knew but you didn't really know what had happened? So he says, what had happened? I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed, but curious, I wondered what had got into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Have you ever been disappointed, but curious? Why? I was going to drink with you, man. We were going to talk about old time. So what's up, right? It doesn't make any sense. Okay. Come, what's all this about, I queried. He looked straight at me, simply but smilingly. He said, I've got religion. Okay, I see Jim over there rolling his eyes. That's the typical reaction too, right? I don't care what your religious background is. When you're drunk and drinking and your buddy comes over and you push a drink and he says no and you ask him why and he says, I got religion, the fun meter goes <laughs> This is going to suck. Right? I was aghast, so that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now, I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right, but bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. So he's setting the stage. I can drown, drown him out by drowning me out. But what happens, because this is an alcoholic properly armed with the facts about himself, he doesn't do any preaching. So watch what happens next. He did no ranting. In a matter-of-fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was two months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. The guy committed for alcoholic insanity had come to pass it on to Bill. He told of two guys he did not know, came and took responsibility for him from the judge, and they told him of a simple religious idea, God dwells in you, and a practicable program of action that will prove that fact to you, through you. Who felt that, besides Carrie Ann? She's back, her hair blew back. Okay. So he said, I, he had come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. He didn't come to pass a meeting list. He didn't come to pass advice. He came to share the experience, which Bill encountered the minute he opened the door and saw him standing there fresh skin and glowing. Because what Bill did not know is he had encountered the presence. I was shocked but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. We talk, he talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed, my grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folk and their doings, his insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen. His fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died, these recollections welled up from the past and they made me swallow hard. He's talking about a revelatory spirit when he thought of his grandfather's fearlessness at the point of death, describing his relationship with God was strong enough that he didn't have to hear a religious opinion. 
what he's talking about. And he said that when that revelation came to him, it made him swallow hard. How many of you, without knowing it was coming, had a movement of the Spirit that forced an emotion through you and you had to choke it back? So he's starting to talk. This is a famous atheist now that's starting to talk to you about his experience of power, which changed his mind. So then he goes on to say that wartime day in the old Winchester Cathedral came back again. If you read earlier in the story, he was on his way to war, he was scared, he went in a churchyard, and he found a headstone of an old soldier who had survived war, yet drank himself to death. And now Bill is an old soldier who survived war, and he's in New York drinking himself to death, and he described them that the power came to me, but it was fleeting and soon lost, and so the revelation now is, that power was with me then, and the power is revisiting me now. There may be something to this timeless stuff. I'd always believed in a power greater than myself. I'd often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. So now he's starting to recant his own profession, right, in real time. Few people really are, for that means blind faith and strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much of precise, immutable law and no intelligence? So a question mark. So he's starting to question his own professed beliefs. He's not ready to profess theology. He's willing to consider there might be more to life than what he's acknowledging. I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who knew neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. So that's where Bill met the power that Ebby showed up and shared his experience of with him. Does that make sense? And that's his revelation of where God met Bill. Okay? So with ministers in the world's religions, I parted right there when they talked of a God personal to me who was love, superhuman strength, and direction. I became irritated, and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. To Christ, I, considered, I conceded certainty of a great man not too closely followed by those who claimed him. How many of you have been injured by the church? So the consequence of that is an unbeliever like Bill. That, that he got mad when people spoke of superhuman love because that was not what he had seen demonstrated by God's people. I'm not trying to beat up anybody. I'm just saying this is we come with these prejudices and, and people die as a result. And, and that's why we're specially empowered to not be that guy. Right? Okay. So his moral teaching, most excellent for myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. The wars had been fought, the burnings and the chicanery that religious dispute had facilitated made me sick. I honestly doubted whether on balance the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I'd seen in Europe and since, the power of God and human affairs was negligible. The brotherhood of man, a grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed the boss universal, and he certainly had me. So Bill the atheist was more willing to believe in the devil than he was to believe in a loving God. That's how he got here. So if any of you think you're too far gone to encounter this power, be met where you are and be restored, it's simply not true. That's why he's telling us the story in the way he's telling it. Wherever you are, come. Okay? But my friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. Then he had, in effect, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he'd ever known. You ever hear the arguments in the rooms, whether we're recovered or we're recovering? It's not an argument. They just told you what the experience was. Recovered is not a medical term. It's a mining term. Taken from a scrap heap and raised to a level of life better than the best we've ever known. They, meant, they said the word recovered 17 times in the instructions. And they only said recovering twice, and that's in a chapter to the wife about the still drinking alcoholic. They were talking about redemption rather than 
abstinence. Does that make sense? Okay. Had this power originated in him? Bill's starting to question it, right? He's like, I know this cat. Obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute. And this was none at all. So what does powerless mean? Drunk or sober, powerless. My friend Brad taught a lesson one time. He said, how much power did Lazarus have to come out of that grave? And that was none at all. Not until he was called. Right? Remember your addiction's a calling, not a curse, but you decide and then you learn to tell the story. Okay? And we're not coming in the grave for you, we're calling you out. That floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in the human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. You ever had people talk about, oh, that's a miracle, coffee's a miracle, and you're like, what the fuck is a miracle to you, man? I mean, the dude put water in some shit. That... You ever heard that? How many of you, when you finally saw one, realized that that word had been misused? Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table, and he shouted great tidings. This guy's dead. He can't possibly be here sober, and he's here telling me of a life I don't know, but I desperately want. Look at the profundity of that. Some of you are still feeling that. I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized. He was on a different footing. His roots grasp a new soil. Despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me vestiges of my old prejudice. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy. So now it didn't anger him, he just didn't care. Any of you relate to him? I can ignore it as long as you can. Okay. When the thought was expressed that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. I didn't like the idea. How many of you have had something similar? I don't want to hear about it. I don't like the idea. I could go for such conceptions as creative intelligence, universal mind, spirit of nature, but I resisted the thought of a czar of the heavens, however loving his sway might be. I've since talked with many scores of men who felt the same way. We don't spend enough time helping people sort out their prejudice so they can receive what's freely given, right? So Bill's telling you where, where he was met, so that if you're there, you realize this isn't that tough. We just got to start owning the experience, right? My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Now, that's been weirdly taught over the years that they talk of a God of our understanding. That's not that they said. They said a God as they understood him. And who's we? The first 100. And they just clearly told you what they understood about God was drastically revised once they encountered God. So prior to an encounter, of course you don't understand, but once you've had an encounter, your understanding never ceases to grow. That's why it's always in past tense, as we understood him, because the God I understood then is not the God I understand now, and I don't even think it's my understanding. Anyway, that statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. Why is he saying that? How many of you, when you finally got it, you got hit with the power, and someone pointed out to you, that, that's the power we call God, and you're like, where has this been? It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. We don't stay there, because we have a manner of living, a process, that is relevant, but will prove the power to us, through us, right? But at least we have the encounter and we know we're seeking tangible power, yes? A spiritual solution for a spiritual problem, okay? I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. Thus, I was convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, there's Ebby, I felt the revelation of going to war and his grandfather, and then I believed. 
No one's ever asked you in 12-step recovery to believe in something you had not experienced. Simply, if, not if they're teaching it right. It's not a group of drunks. It's not a light bulb or a doorknob or any mystical nonsense. Power's found within you. You'll recognize it as a feeling for a friend. As soon as we get you tapped in, you're going to recognize it as power, peace, happiness, sense of direction flowing into you. And the more you share it with others, the more you'll grow in consciousness of it on your life. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. For a brief moment, I had needed and wanted God. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. So now he's telling you about his encounter before he went to war. But soon, his, the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, mostly those within myself. So it had been ever since how blind I had been. So he was blinded by calamity of war and then the drinking, you know, pomps and worships. And then, anyway, at the hospital I was separated for alcohol from the last time. Treatment seemed wise for I showed signs of delirium tremens. There I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him to do with me as he would. So how did Bill then understand God? Revelation experience, miracles. Any of you heard about a power of signs and wonders follow? So what did it sound like he did? I, to do with me as he would, I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. Does it sound like a step? Any of you ever do a third step decision? Does it sound something like that? I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing. Without him I was lost. I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch. I've not had a drink since. His newfound friend, he found within himself, and he witnesses he has not had a drink since. You notice how he did not witness he's not had a problem since. How many of you sobered up and found out life still showed up? My school, schoolmate visited me, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. What's that sound like? Sound like Abby showed up and he did a fourth and fifth step, didn't it? We made a list of people I'd heard or toward whom I felt resentment. Definitely fourth step stuff, yeah? I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. What's that sound like? Isn't that a seven-step prayer, asking for God to take all of me, good and bad? Yeah? Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Consciousness is the awareness of being aware. I'm, God, I'm aware of God's power within me. Not only am I aware, but I'm aware that I'm aware. You know the difference between being aware and being aware that you're aware? You ever driven by your exit and you were aware it was your exit? It would, if you were aware that you were aware, you would have turned on your exit. <laughs> I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. So, there's a song out there, pretty popular, this is how I fight my battles. But many of us in this room were fighters, yeah? yeah? Warriors. Okay, your new weapons are the mind and prayer. Believe that. And strength to meet my problems as he would have. He never was I to pray for myself, except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter on a new relationship with my creator. Why would I want a new relationship with a creator I didn't believe in? I wouldn't. But he now believed in the experience and what you learn through the process is your relationship with creation is your relationship with creator. So if you're having a rough time in creation, check in with creator. Power, peace, happiness, sense of direction. Make sense? I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God. Notice how the words they used. Why do we come to believe in power? Because that's our first encounter. Right? Plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. 
So notice they put the order right in here, willingness, honesty, and humility, as opposed to H-O-W. Bill wrote a book later and he put honesty in the first. I wasn't capable of honesty in the first step. I was delusional. What came to me was willingness because I was beat to shit. So the reason I call that to your face, it isn't how, it's who. I don't know how, that's above my pay grade, but I do know who. And it ain't me. Okay? Bill had it right. I just want you to see. He had it right once, then he had to sell more books. <laughs> okay. Simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us all. These were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, so the minute he realized that the power was real and the process made sense, he had a spiritual experience on the spot which he described, so that you understand it was tangible. He said, I fully accepted them. The effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. And what I've watched over the years is many times people have sudden and profound effects, but no one calls to their attention the effect they just had. And so it happens and they don't know it. So our job is to make sure they know it, call it to their attention, because we would cheat them to talk to them about the power we call God without a demonstration. Yeah? Okay. For a moment I was alarmed. <laughs> you ever have a spiritual experience and then, that was a little weird. <laughs> I called my friend a doctor to ask if I were still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. Finally he shook his head saying, something's happened to you I don't understand, but you'd better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. The good doctor now sees many men who've had such experiences. He knows that they are real. How does the doctor know that they're real? Because conversions come with a signature. Right? We see them here every day, don't we, folks? While I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have and what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, in turn, might work with others. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs, particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. I've heard people claiming long-term sobriety saying it's not necessary to work one-on-one -on -one with people. Bullshit. Our entire model is built on a peer model. You are empowered to heal by the healer. And if you don't use it, you'll not receive the healing you need to maintain it. So we implore you, please, turn to your brother and sister. Help them carry their burdens, because whatever it is they're carrying, you're uniquely qualified to carry for them. And in that, you'll receive more power than you need, and you'll get the healing for the condition you don't know how to cure. And it's been recorded as witnessed in this book for many, many years. And next week we'll talk about that encounter. But thank you very much.